All right, this video today is truly a gram negative grab bag. It is kind of a selection of organisms that are similar, but not really similar, but kind of are fastidious, but kind of aren't. So bear with me. I have done my very best to pick out the most important facts about these organisms. The ones we're going to be looking at today are the Brucella species, the Bartonella species, Bordetella species, Legionella pneumophilia, Francisella tularensis, and Streptobacillus. So there are a couple of them you may have heard of before, Legionnaire's disease, um, and whooping cough, for example, and a couple of them you maybe haven't, and hopefully I'll be able to keep you engaged enough to listen to the whole story about all these things. Now, there's way more that you can read about in your book or in other books, but I'm going to give you, again, the fast facts about each of these. And we're going to start with Brucella. And please keep in mind that when I say Brucella SPP, that means it's a group of organisms. And I think almost every single time I talk about anything in this class, it's never just one Pseudomonas, right? There's more than one. So keep that in mind here. When we talk about Brucella, we're going to talk about um, the handful that you can see here on the right side, Brucella bordis, Melitonensis, um, Suis canis, all of these things. And those names, Ovis, Canis, like I said, Suis, should kind of tip you off that these tend to be residing in animal reservoirs and can be contracted by contact with animals and then maybe through um, milk or products, animal products that are not properly sterilized. If we talk about the way Brucella looks, and this, these are all gram-negative bacilli, but please keep in mind that all the organisms are, a lot of them are very pleomorphic, so that means they have kind of a wide variety of shapes. When you say bacilli, you're being very generous. These are very small organisms. They tend to be non-modal, non excuse me, and they are cacobacilli. From an identification and growth standpoint, this is going to be a theme throughout the PowerPoint very slow growing. So we're going to be talking about like days to weeks. And so ideally in a lab, you know, we can identify things a lot faster than that. So many of the things we're going to talk about today are going to be more readily diagnosed using nucleic acid sequencing or serological tests. So keep that in mind. This organism will grow on blood auger, chocolate auger, and modified Thayer Martin, but it will not grow on MAC. So for that reason, among other things, it can be somewhat picky and fastidious. They are catalase, oxidase, and urease positive. And depending on, you know, which one of these we're talking about, your specimen of choice might be blood, bone marrow, or tissue, particularly lymph tissue. It is actually, these organisms tend to be on the CDC bioterrorism threat list because there is the potential for purposeful food contamination using them. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the pathogens we need to be concerned with and the disease they cause. As I said, they're found in animal reservoirs. Think of any contact we have with animals or food products that are animal-based. And they are intracellular organisms. So as you know about things that live inside other cells, that makes them really resistant to phagocytosis and killing by any serum elements, whether that's antibodies or complement. It's a really good hiding spot to be in a cell. One of the main conditions that results from infection with the Brucella species is something called undulant fever. And I put this little clip art of some waves here because undulant means sort of wave-like. It comes and it goes. And that's exactly what happens when you have an infection with Brucella. You'll have this fever that sort of comes and goes and comes and goes. And as you saw, these organisms um, not only will be found in the blood, but they can migrate to tissues and bone marrow. They have an affinity for tissues that have erythritol in it, which is just a chemical, sugar. And places like the breast, the uterus, placenta, and epididymis, so a lot of the reproductive organs are places where Brucella likes to be. When you are infected, it's a very nonspecific sort of symptoms at first. Chills, sweat, fatigue, weakness. A lot of times night, night sweats are common when you have Brucella. And then that can ultimately progress to a more systemic disease because if it's moving out of, you know, the, the gut into the blood... Um, and then ultimately into an organ, you're going to see lesions, you're going to see if it gets into the joints, you're going to see joint issues, 
all sorts of other things can happen depending on where it ends up. So unfortunately, it kind of starts off like the flu and then ultimately ends up a little worse than that. If we look at it growth wise, very small pinpoint and non hemolytic colonies, this would be blood agar, I believe on the left. And when I say pleomorphic, and when I say use the term bacilli very roughly, this is why. Look at the pictures here. This is one of the Bartonella species. It doesn't look very bacilli at all. It's much more cacobacilli than bacilli. And you'll also see that many of the organisms today are not good at gram staining. They retain dye very poorly. This one actually looks sort of pink and purple. I'm wondering if the person knew that it was bad at holding stain and maybe kept the crystal violet on there a little longer than normal. Either way, this is kind of the, the gist, the ins and outs of the Brucella species. Sticking with the bee theme, moving to Bartonella, the pathogens in the Bartonella family, I probably shouldn't say family, I doubt that that's actually phylogenetically correct, but let's just say family, uh, is you see Hensile, Bacilliformis, and Kuntana. And we'll talk about what each of those causes in a moment from a morphology standpoint. Again, not, not a lot to say, and you'll see why we don't have a lot to say morphologically. Cacobacilli and also an intracellular pathogen. It's really not practical to grow these in the lab, which is why describing them is not super helpful because it's unlikely you're actually going to see them. They are too slow, between 9 to 40 days, and so we tend to use things like PCR to identify them a little more readily. It will require, if you try to grow it, supplemented chocolate auger, and it's going to need extra CO2 in the atmosphere. It's usually around 5 to 10%, and a little bit of humidity, so it's fussy. I think that these should really have been in the Haemophilus Neisseria chapter because all of these things are kind of fussy in terms of growth. There is hemolysis, there is some nitrate reduction, oh, excuse me, there's no hemolysis, excuse, excuse me, there's no nitrate reduction and there is no urease activity. All those are negative. I should put that negative first when I'm reading these things. Now, when we talk about the diseases caused by the Bartonella family here, they tend to be contacted or transmitted through direct contact from, you know, someone who might have it or from an arthropod vector. And one of the things that's kind of strange, if, you, if we know anything about malaria, malaria is also transmitted through an arthropod um, and can infect your red blood cells. So it, it doesn't necessarily look the same. Malaria is larger, but it has kind of a similar means of getting where it's going. Now, uh, Bru Bartonella, excuse me, Hensile causes what's known as cat scratch disease. And this tends to be an infection because this organism colonizes the oral pharynx of a cat or just, you know, cats in general. If you're bitten by a cat, if you're scratched by a cat, if there's some sort of con open wound contact with a cat, <coughs> excuse me, you could potentially contract this. Um, a lymphadenopathy, so inflamed lymph node around the site of the scratch, which of course can always uh, become bacteremia if it's not treated. Carrion's disease is called by Bacilliformis, and it starts with an acute fever but can form a pretty severe anemia. And that's because these organisms can infect the red blood cells, and in fact, when they do that, they cause their destruction. You'll also see the formation of red-purple hemangiomas, which are like little blood, I won't say blisters, but little blood bumps, essentially, of tumor, oma, and hemangi blood that kind of pop up throughout the body. Trench fever, caused by uh, Bartonella quintana, tends to be a relapsing fever, so it's kind of like undulant, but not quite the same, and is actually transmitted by lice. And it can result in things like myalgia, bone pain, particularly in the shins, and splenomegaly. This actually tends to be common in people who are living in urban areas and happen to be um, poor or homeless because their living conditions are not ideal, and lice tends to be something that can happen and can spread really easily when you have a lot of people in one place. When we look at growth, again, pretty unlikely you're going to see it, but this is growth on a kind of a specialized auger. It's a hematin auger, so it's it's like chocolate, essentially. has some yeast extracts in it to supplement with nutrients. Very small little colonies. This is a trend you'll see through the rest of these organisms. The red line in the upper right corner is pointing to some of the bacteria that have infected the red cell. 
once you get skilled at identifying malaria, you'll know this isn't malaria, but it does look kind of similar. So you got to know what you're looking for here. And this is just a picture. It actually comes from a veterinary website, which makes sense since these are found in animals and oftentimes cats that has a couple pictures of what it looks like on a gram stain. So nothing really remarkable, but important to note nonetheless. Moving to Bordetella. Now this is one you're probably familiar with because Bordetella pertussis causes what we call whooping cough. Other organisms like parapertussis and bronchoseptica can cause other similar lung infections, but we're going to focus on B. pertussis because that's the one that's kind of sort of making a comeback, unfortunately, because of um, vaccination status. Now, morphology-wise, very small coccobacillus. This is boring. I'm going to say it about 100 times as we go through this. It is a very strict aerobe. You do not want much CO2, if any at all, in the environment that it's growing in. Fussy, but in a different way than Haemophilus and Neisseria, it really is oxygen-loving, right? Aerophilic, I would say. From a specimen of choice standpoint, it would be really nice to have a nasopharyngeal swab, so kind of the back of the throat. You don't want to use sputum for a couple of these organisms because there's a lot of normal flora that can come up with the sputum. And so in this case, we wanted to use um, nasal, nasopharyngeal swab. We'll see this again in other places. Oftentimes it's identified using PCR. It's very virulent. It's very easy to get sick when you're around it. So they try to kind of eliminate that, obviously, and make diagnostics faster and easier using polymerase chain reaction. There are two special types of auger, which we'll see on the other side, Bordet Genju, I think. I should have asked my dad how to pronounce that because he speaks French, and I think that's a French word. Um, and then Reagan Low, I can handle that one. And I'll talk a little bit about what makes those special on the next slide and kind of why we can get Bordetella to grow on them. There are different biochemical reactions for each of these different species and you will have to be able to tell them apart because they kind of cause similar conditions and I will show you that on the next slide. Now looking specifically at whooping cough, the name whooping cough is is such that when you have it, obviously it's a lung infection and these organisms will adhere and multiply on the ciliated epith epithelium of the respiratory tract. And as you can kind of see here, there's a sort of a, a period a couple phases that you go through when you have whooping cough. We have incubation of about seven to 10 days. There are no symptoms. Then you have the catarrhal stage, which is about one to two weeks. It's the one where you're most infective. You have a runny nose, you're tired, fever, sneezing. You're not really very hungry. We have the paroxysmal phase, which is the next two to four weeks where you have a repetitive cough with whoops. And the whoops are really from the <gasps> breathing in that comes from that you know, after you've coughed, 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 you need to catch your breath. And so it's really hard to breathe in when you have all this gunk in your lungs. Vomiting can happen. Elevated white cells can happen. And then you have convalescent, which is essentially sort of untreated and not, um, I don't know, you know, not resolving itself sort of infection. The cough will kind of go away, but you might start to see secondary complications, pneumonia, seizures. You can see encephalopathy, obviously causing inflammation. Anywhere around the brain is not good. So we have been lucky enough to largely eradicate this. And we'll talk about that in a moment. When we look at the growth, on the BG auger, this is a special auger that has a potato infusion because it likes starch. Starch is something that this organism prefers when it grows. And it has blood as well as glycerol. They used to call this a cough plate because they would literally have people who had whooping cough cough directly on the plate and then they would grow it. The colonies are described as mercury droplets. Like if you imagine liquid mercury and what the droplets form, kind of those rounded bubbles, that's what they're supposed to look like. I don't think they have a metallic sheen. Uh, the Reagan Low auger is unique because it has charcoal in it. It's made of horse blood, which is easier to break for these organisms, and it has antibiotics. Charcoal is a neutralizing agent. It neutralizes fatty acids and peroxides, which can be kind of toxic to Bordetella, and so it helps to, you know, helps their growth by inhibiting those things. When it comes to comparing these three different species, you can see you can compare them or identify them based on in part oxidase, motility, urea, and if they will grow on McConkie auger. And I'll let you sort of figure that out for yourself, but you can see that each of them 
has somewhat of a unique pattern and that would be helpful in identification. As I said, we vaccinate against whooping cough and as a result, there's generally not a lot of it in the United States. But as vaccination rates go down and herd immunity gets less, we have actually seen higher higher levels of whooping cough. It's primarily a disease of children, and so it can be really dangerous. You know, breathing when you're a little little kid can be really difficult. Those lungs are not super big, and that's why, obviously, vaccination is promoted. Um, and you get it in the DPT, the diphtheria, uh, pertussis, and tetanus shot, or DTP, Tdap. There's a whole bunch of names for it. All right, moving out of the Bs into the Ls. This is not alphabetical, as you'll see. We're going to talk about Legionella. And Legionella is one that you've probably heard before because it causes Legionnaire's disease. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But let's just talk briefly about its morphology. It's poorly staining. It is modal. And oftentimes, like the other organisms, because they're hard to grow and hard to see, we use fluorescent antibodies to detect them. So you'd have a specimen, you've had, had antibodies with a specific Legionella epitope that it's looking for. And then that fluorescence that's attached to the antibody will be given off when you look at it under a fluorescent microscope. That was a terrible explanation of fluorescence microscopy. But please understand that usually we use fancier techniques than a gram stain to identify this thing. <laughs> take take uh, serology and I'll do a better job explaining that process. Slow growing, aerobic, and asacrolytic. So it doesn't really use sugars. We can't even use that fermentation and oxidation to figure out what it is. It will be positive for catalase, gelatinase, which is an enzyme that breaks down gelatin, as you might assume, beta-lactamase, so it's penicillin resistant. It is oxidase positive and hippurate hydrolysis positive. So knowing all of those things, you can obviously use that to help identify it. It is grown on a special type of auger called BCYE. I'll show you on the next slide, but it's buffered charcoal yeast extract with a couple other extra things sprinkled in to make it happy. And the specimens of choice are bronchial washings, pleural fluid, blood, not sputum, as I said, because sputum tends to have too much other stuff that can overgrow. Um, and actually urine. There's a urine antigen test that you can use to look for one of the strains of Legionella. So Legionella pneumophilia is the one that we are most concerned with. It causes Legionnaire's disease and Pontiac fever. Um, Legionnaire's disease was named such because there was an outbreak at a Legionnaire's convention in Philadelphia. I think it was either the 60s or 70s. I can't remember off the top of my head. And this is kind of where this organism was discovered. It is something that grows in aquatic habitats. So it tends to grow in cooling towers for air conditioning, water fountains, nebulizers, hot tubs, and it's very resistant to antiseptics and chlorine and all of that stuff. So it's hard to kill. I think that one of the casinos around here not too long ago had a Legionnaire's issue in their their air conditioning units. It was I, it was probably a couple of years, but this is something that once it grows there, it becomes aerosolized and it spreads. Now, Pontiac fever is a very similar disease. It was called Pontiac fever because there was an outbreak in Pontiac, Michigan, actually. It's a little bit less intense than Pontiac fever. Um, you'll still get sort of disease, like, Febrile disease, excuse me, chills, myalgia. You know, you're not going to feel so great, but it doesn't have the same lung involvement that Legionnaire's disease has. So typically what happens when you inhale the aerosols, they will actually invade your alveolar macrophages. So the macrophages that live in your lungs. And when they're inside there, they prevent the lysosomes from fusing with the, the phagosomes, which they've been ingested through. And then that means that they are not killed once they're inside the cell. Notice that intracellular theme that's going through all of this. There is something called purulent pneumonia that results. Again, if you think about pneumonia and purulent, meaning that you have this white blood cell infiltrate, there's a non-productive cough, a headache. Um, the lungs, obviously, the more gunk you have in the lungs, the harder it's going to be to breathe. And if it's not treated, it can lead to multi-organ failure. So somewhat nasty. It can be a public health issue, obviously, because large amounts of people, if they're in a space and they're breathing the same air and the same air conditioner is, you know, blasting through, you're going to see, you know, epidemics happen 
of Legionnaire's disease. So you have to report to the health department a lot of these uh, when we talk about them because they can be public health issues. Now that BCYE auger, the buffered charcoal yeast extract with uh, extra things in it, looks as did the other augers with charcoal in it. It's kind of um, black, right? And you can see here that the, the growth can be very different. You have glistening, flat, round colonies. Sometimes they're described, if you look at the bottom right plate, as glass, ground glass or speckled colonies. And then you can see here on the far right that when you grow them, especially in broth, they are very pliomorphic. They can be really long and filamentous. Um, they can be kind of single bacilli. They can be diplobacilli. Pretty hard to tell. And if you also didn't notice, a lot of these things were named like after people that discovered it. So Francisella is no exception. And we are most likely concerned with Francisella tularensis, which causes a disease called tularemia. And we'll talk about that in a moment. These are teeny, teeny, tiny, like little baby micrometer size. And they're also cacobacilli, as I've said before. They are strict aerobes. They are slow growers. Are you getting the trend here? They need special stuff when they grow. Not just blood auger, but blood auger supplemented with cysteine is a requirement. They can grow on chocolate auger. I think you're still going to need to make sure there's enough cysteine in there. Modified Thayer Martin. They can grow on BCYE. They will not grow on MAC. They are negative for catalase, oxidase, and urease. And specimen of choice tends to be a tissue biopsy, blood, or a lesion swab, and you'll see why that is the case. Now, tularemia caused by Francisella tularensis is found in animals, so things like birds, fish, rabbits, ticks, flies. Um, it can be transmitted oftentimes by arthropods. And as are the other organisms, they are intracellular antiphagocytic pathogens. They can cause three sort of different types of tularemia, or tular uh, I guess tularemia, that implies blood infection, and so I, I suppose that's fair. But when you look at tularemia, it actually manifests in places outside of the bloodstream. We have ulceroglandular tularemia, as you can see, forming an ulcerated uh, opening on the skin here. Oculoglandular, so this is with the involves the eyes and then you can see the lymph nodes that are around the jaw and then pneumonic so obviously pneumonia i remember tularemia because i watched that show alone if you've ever seen it where they like literally drop people off in like the arctic alone and a woman was so excited she had killed a rabbit they have to survive that's the thing they have to survive with like 10 items she killed a rabbit. She was so excited, and then she opened it up, and its liver had just tularemia all over it, and she couldn't eat it. And so that has stuck out in my head. If you look up, like, infected organs with tularemia, it might, it might stand out to you, too. <laughs> when you look at uh, tularemia, how they label us as cacobacillus, I don't know. I really don't, because this looks very much like not a bacilli at all, but you can sort of see here it's got that gram-negative hue. You can see it growing on the augers that have been supplemented, very small, gray, alpha hemolytic, although you can't tell that. There's the chocolate auger on the top or maybe modified there, Martin, and then that supplemented blood auger with the cysteine on the bottom. Last but not least, we have streptobacillus. And if nothing else about these organisms, they sure cause a lot of funky named diseases. Streptobacillus is a very pleomorphic string of beads or pearls looking gram negative rod. The ends can be somewhat enlarged and I will show you that on the next slide. They do not have capsules. Most of these organisms do not have capsules if I haven't said that. Um, yet. It's not super important whether encapsulated or not, but just as a note, these ones are not. From an ID and growth standpoint, they are negative for indole, oxidase, catalase, and nitrate reduction. So they're kind of boring, at least for those tests. I'm not going to say they're boring in general. They are microaerophilic, so we know we want um, a little more CO2 in the environment when we're trying to grow them. They need some special supplemented media, as always, as all of these things do. And usually, like many other ones, they are identified serologically. Now, the disease that is caused by Streptobacillus monoliformis is rat bite fever. And I'm not out to 
make rats scary. I think they're actually kind of cute, and I think they have a bad rap. I mean, the ones that live in a sewer are scary, and obviously stay away from them. But pet rats are not are not so bad. This this pathogen, this bacterial group, colonizes the rodent pharynx, and so obviously if they bite you or if they scratch you and like saliva gets into the hand, it's potentially going to cause an issue. I was Googling or YouTubing videos for some of these things, and I found um, one of those Monsters Inside Me videos, which are just a little bit dramatic in my opinion. But if you're interested, I did put it in the modules. You can watch what happens when someone has rat bite fever because it actually can become lethal, to be honest. And it was a child actually in the video, so it was pretty intense. What'll happen is you get a rash, rash, excuse me, a petechial rash. Petechiae are like little bruises all over the body. And it's very blotchy. You have, again, kind of the fever, headache, chills, myalgia. That's sort of just the general sign of inflammation. But then you're going to have polyarthritis. So the joints are really going to hurt because this organism tends to make its way to that location and cause that inflammation. If we look at how it looks when it grows, you can see letter A on the upper left and then letter B on the middle right are both the same organism. I can't find a really great picture of like the, the pearls on a string, but you can see that they do have these sort of enlarged areas right here and here and here, which helps to identify them. They are tiny, they are transparent, uh, and they really like auger that has serum added to it. They also really like horse blood, if I remember correctly. This picture C is showing the rat bite that this woman had that ultimately um, gave her rat bite fever. All right, so that is the down and dirty on these miscellaneous gram-negative organisms. Think about how they are similar. Think about how they are different. Think about where they overlap and where they don't. That's going to be an important way to kind of keep them separated from one another. As always, ask questions if you have them and shoot me an email if you'd like.